all right hey out there in facebook land and eventually hey out there in podcast land as well i'm jonathan haupt i'm the executive director of our nonprofit pat conroy literary center welcome to the december episode of our live from the pat conroy literary center podcast and in the year and a half i've been doing the show this is the first time ever that the guest and I have actually been live in the Pat Conroy Literary Center. We usually do this as a call-in show. And I'm probably going to over-explain what this is initially because this uh, video and audio will live several different lives. So right now we're broadcasting on the Facebook page of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. And later we'll be posting this as a podcast and also sharing it through the Conroy Center social media feeds and our email newsletter. So however you have discovered this video and or audio file, thank you for doing that. It's a real pleasure to get to share this conversation with Janice Ray, who has been uh, part of our Conroy Center a couple of times previously, uh, but I'm excited to have you back. So let me do a quick little introduction for anybody who is brand new, not yet immersed in the universe of Janice Ray, and then we get to talk for a while, which I'm very much looking forward to. So Janice is an author, a naturalist, and an activist, and the author of seven books of nonfiction and poetry, including Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, which won the American Book Award, and most recently, this beauty right here, Wild Spectacles, Seeking Wonders in a World Beyond Humans, and that'll mostly be the subject of our conversation today. Her uh, nature writings have been published in many, many magazines and journals, and she has been honored with the Pushcart Prize, the Nautilus Book Award, and the Donald L. Jordan Prize for Literary Excellence, among others. Janice lives on an organic farm uh, inland from Savannah, Georgia, so not too far from us here in Pat Conroy's beloved Beaufort. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Oh. It's a real honor, Jonathan, to be here, especially to, to be in the Pat Conroy Literary Center and to be with you and to be with all, all your guests. Thank you. We got to uh, take a quick look at the Conroy Center, which you've seen in an earlier incarnation before, but it's a little different now. It's and a it's... glorious place. You, he would be so proud, and I know how proud you are, and I'm proud of you. I think you'd have a lot of questions about why we have a pair of his pants under a glass case on a wall. <laughs> and maybe be a little bit embarrassed that his name's all over everything. But once he got over that, I think he would, yeah. he would love the work that goes on here. He would love the teaching and the community building that we do through the Conroe Center. And my, my favorite part is his writing desk. It's, it says very ornate, glorious antique desk with a leather top. Uh, carved on all sides with a very large leather chair and he wrote by hand Jonathan tells me on an incline yes. thank you for showing me that and letting me take mm -hmm. pictures of it Pat would describe sitting down at that desk and doing the same thing that every other writer does just trying to push through the crushing self-doubt that we all face yeah. and he would say you know Hemingway used to do this Fitzgerald did this who am I, Pat Conroy, to think that I can do that? Mm -hmm. And now other people sit at their desks and think, mm -hmm. Pat Conroy did this. Who am I to think that I can write like Pat Conroy? Mm -hmm. But that's not the goal. The goal is to find your voice, to who, mm -hmm. who, what you can put on the page that is mm -hmm. uniquely your own. Mm -hmm. And Pat did that at that desk for about half of his writing life. So it's really special for us to have it here. And and. I think also it's important to mention the place where he was, like how, and you, this, you may have a question about this later, so you can pause mm -hmm. me if you'd like, but I, when I drove in today and drove along Bay Street under these immense live oaks hanging with Spanish moss and the river, you know, the, mar the salt marshes and the river is, is just right there. I mean, it, it, the place meant so much to him and it, it, filtered through all of his work and I'm sure that sitting at the writing desk I don't know I just think the place was also embracing him it was in a really interesting visual way too I mean Pat fell in love with this landscape when he was 15 16 years old when he came here for the first time having never seen the low country before they never mm -hmm. had any sort of sense of how magical this place mm -hmm. was and even during the roughly 20 years when he was too controversial to be here, when he was living everywhere else, he was still writing about the Lowcountry, still trying mm -hmm. to get back here in his imagination. 
So when he had that desk on the Fripp Island house, it wouldn't have been in the middle of the room like it is now. It was pushed up against a window so he could look out and watch the movie, as he said, the tidal marsh or tidal lagoon at that particular house. Mm -hmm. And at the, the house that Pat was living in when he passed away, where Cassandra still lives, the desk was also up against a window. And at that mm -hmm. house, he was looking out at Battery Creek. He really needed mm -hmm. to see the world and to feel connected to mm -hmm. it. Uh, to, to, to write the way that he did, he really needed to feel that sense of communion with nature. Mm -hmm. So let me turn that into a question since mm -hmm. we've ended up at this point. How do you do that? What, what's mm -hmm. your writing space? What's your mm -hmm. connectivity to what you're writing about in the moment that you're actually doing the writing? Mm -hmm. There's so much I want to say, but I, I want to say that first about Pat, Yeah. that I've I teach place-based writing mm -hmm. a lot, you know, being mainly a nature writer. Yeah. And there's a quote, and I forget which book it's from, but it's it's like, you know, here, you know, let me let me open an oyster for you and smell the smell of the salt marsh and see the great blue heron. But but it was like, let me open this oyster for you there. That's the taste of my, my childhood. childhood. Oh, you know that quote. You probably have it memorized. I'm actually teaching it to fourth graders next Tuesday when I'm yeah. as a part of a poetry class. Can you class. recite it now? I can get pretty close to it, yeah. Uh, probably not. But the part at the end is, let yeah. me... Uh, Take an oyster, open it with a pocket knife, yeah. and feed it to you. There, that taste, that's the taste of my childhood. Yeah. And it's the from the prologue to The Prince of Tide. So it's right. that's character right. Tom Wingo describing an experience that uh, it's a little younger than Pat Conroy would have had it, but still Pat mm -hmm. sort of dropping you into the place. Right. Uh, using all five senses and not necessarily calling attention to all five, but using mm -hmm. all five. Yeah. So that's part of the lesson and, next week. And so your question for me is how does place... So I'm from the south of Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, it's the coastal plains area, you mm -hmm. know, inland from Savannah, below Macon, where the, the fall line is. And I have been, I came back, I live there now, and I came back because I think that if educated people leave, you know, if creative people leave, mm -hmm. if different, if LGBTQ people leave, if anybody who might not be, you know, the, the so-called norm leaves, it spelled, like it, it also, it, it just, the place remains in a sort of atrophied, fundamentalist, stagnant. So that's why I came back. I came back to like to really do honor to my place mm -hmm. and, and to try to uh, just to try to assist it in any way possible. And so how it shows up in my writing is it's often the subject matter of my writing. But but I also, we live on an organic farm. It's 13 miles to the nearest village, which is the village at Reedsville. is very small. Mm -hmm. And I live in the delta of two rivers that come together, the mm -hmm. Ohupi and the Altamaha. Hall. Um, those rivers have large floodplains, and so it's about two miles to each river. But I'm in that. It we don't even have cell service where we live, so I I am just interacting with nature all the time with bird song, with cicada song, with cricket song. I mean, all the time with the way the light um, the the way the light comes up, shines, goes down. It's it's just I think that it is imbued there. But uh, there's just, oh gosh, it's just such a beautiful question and so much to say because the, the writers that I love the most mm -hmm. are the writers who were also doing that either in the South or, you know, anywhere as a nature writer. And really, that's why I love Pat Conroy's work so much. That, for two reasons. Yes. One is that, how much he was, how place-based he was, mm -hmm. how much he loved his place. And two, he was a true artisan he was a craftsman with words and uh, you know i'm probably preempting a question here but not everything written these days looks at words as the jewels that they are yes. and for him they were jewels mm -hmm. i hear from so many of pat's readers that they have to read his books twice once for for the plot for the story mm -hmm. but also go back a second time and just immerse themselves mm -hmm. in the lexicon and the word choice and the way that Pat does that. This mm -hmm. was a writer who started out wanting to be a poet, and you write poetry mm -hmm. as well. And I'm really curious about how poetry and prose do mm -hmm. and don't 
uh, mm -hmm. intertwine in your writing as well. Mm -hmm. But but for Pat, he, he described himself as a failed poet. And that's ultimately the lesson I'm teaching the fourth graders next week is how to excavate poetry from mm -hmm. Pat's writing. And the passage that you described about uh, the taste of childhood is mm -hmm. one example where we're going to take it, look at it as prose, but then divide it up with line breaks where I hear Pat's cadence putting those. If you were going to write it as a poem, this is what it would look like. And That's a great the goal exercise. of that lesson is then to teach them to do the reverse. These are kids who don't think they can write poetry, mm -hmm. but you can write a sentence and then you can do the work to turn that sentence into mm -hmm. a poem and then rethink it in that mm -hmm. context. And Pat's nature writing is a great sort of point of entrance for those kids. Mm -hmm. But what about for you as poet and prose writer? Do these mm -hmm. things intertwine? Are the words really as important to you as they are to Pat? They're, they're as important. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I too, I would, I don't think I would, <laughs> I would not be self-deprecating enough to say I'm a failed poet, but I probably am. So I started out as a poet yeah. and now I write in, in a journal, you know, handwriting, a yeah. large black art book that's a journal. And um, there will be pages where there's a start of a poem or almost a whole poem. Mm -hmm. But, but when I went to grad school, this fourth genre of creative nonfiction mm -hmm. was just really hot, you yeah. know? I mean, mm -hmm. we say we invented it in the in the seventies and eighties, but it's it's been around forever. You know, mm -hmm. Thoreau was basically Thoreau was writing creative nonfiction, and so many many people before that. But it was just this really hot genre, and you were getting published a lot. And I thought, I'll never get published as a poet, but maybe. I sh so that's why um, that's why you know when I when I do readings out of my work people people say like like dang that's so lyrical that's yeah. that's because of the poet mm -hmm. and i really work at it like so you talked about the five senses so i i i definitely incorporate the five sen sen senses and when i teach i teach people to write in scene like rendering a yes. scene mm -hmm. moment to moment through the senses Mm -hmm. But also, this is like my secret weapon is that I believe there are just bunches of other senses and like not just, you know, intuition that you and I talked about mm -hmm. before we started the show, but, it, you know, this like a sense of being watched, a sense of time, a sense of place, which is what Pat had so beautiful, yeah. shows so beautifully in his work, a sense of responsibility. And I mean, I call all those things which are invisibles that operate among us and between us. But I, I so I try to use those. And and I, and I'm, I just want to say one more thing, and that is metaphors are like crazily important to me. I'm always like really trying to push myself for the perfect metaphor or a good metaphor. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there are any perfect ones. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, that's enough. I, that all of that shines through in your writing. You do have a way of immersing the reader in an experience of feeling all of the senses that you're describing, not just mm -hmm. the way that the, the five that we sort of think of, but also other things that can that can ground you in a moment that can really bring you into mm -hmm. that. And you do that with such candor. You put so much of yourself on the page too. So in an essay that's arguably about an animal or some sort of interaction, the human story and your story in particular are such a quintessential part of that. Is that easy for you to, to put yourself onto the page that way? Does that feel like a risk at this point or does that become simply your comfort level with this kind of writing? I think it was how I learned to do it because personal narrative was just like that. It was what was happening when mm -hmm. I was, I I went to grad school and studied with Bill with um yeah William Kittredge. I started to say Bill oh. McKibben, but I was studying with Bill Kittredge yeah. in at the University of Montana, and it was all about the personal narrative, you know, mm -hmm. because I mean you can't really hide behind second person you or third person if you are there, you know. I just mm -hmm. I just I think I thought it was a. I thought it was a ploy for people not to just come out and say, I was there, I yeah. thought this, I saw this. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually am, 
I'm, I'm in a movement right now with my work to remove myself more and more from it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I really am trying mm -hmm. to do. So, for example, recently I did a profile uh, for Gravy Magazine, Southern Food Waste yep. Alliance. Mm -hmm. And it was a profile of a, it's called the Chanterelle Seeker. So it's a profile of a young man who lives near me, but he not only grows mushrooms to sell to Husk and other okay. big restaurants, yeah. but he forages in South Georgia for okay. chanterelles and oysters, and, and he's really great at it. He's great at it. He's, he's one of those people obsessed by a thing, you know. So it was, a, it was easy to follow him around. And, I mean, I'm way off track, but, but yeah, I'm trying to remove the eye more and more. And I think I'm going to make a judgment on our culture, but it's because we've become more and more, uh, you know, an egocentric, a self-centered culture. And I, that's embarrassing to me at times. I don't want to really be that. I just want to be a vessel for what I see or what I think to be the truth. Mm -hmm. to, to bear witness, to use a good Southern writing yeah. expression. And on the other hand, it's, that's what stops a lot of student, a student, beginning writers, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, Don Morrill wrote a book called The Untouched Minutes, and he was teaching, uh, he taught in the English department at St. Pete, whatever that, University of South Florida. And he said, um, basically he said this, it, it's not about your experience, it's about experience. Mm, you, you get it? I do. Yes, that's well said. I it's like about that. the human experience. Yeah. You just happen to see it. Mm -hmm. And I, and it's that. That is the secret to remember for a beginning writer. Because it's not about you. This is not telling the story of your life. This is telling the story of your life that is going to enlighten somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. Like, that is really what we're doing here. Wiley Cash uh, took sort of a, a similar approach to that idea trying to explain the way one tells a story versus the way one experiences a chronology of events. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have that one friend who will call us and say, you will not believe the day I've had. And they'll just give you sort of the hour by hour account. That's not a story. It's not, yeah. it's not impacting yeah. you. There's no shape to it. Right. Uh, yes, but that's sort of yeah. the disconnect. But it's, yeah. you know, it's I'm the protagonist of my story and I'm going mm -hmm. to tell you what my day has been, whether you want to hear it or not. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not what you do. You really mm -hmm. you sort of parachute us into a moment or a series of moments, scene by scene, as you say, uh, mm -hmm. but bring the world to life. Mm -hmm. But you are the conduit that, that lets us mm -hmm. sort of experience that. So I'm really curious about what your writing will look like, what the shape of it will be, just to return to that phrase. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're removing yourself from it, are you mm -hmm. finding that easy to do or difficult to do? Um, it, it's I, to me, for me, it's the, the subject matter mostly changes. Yeah. So instead of focusing on myself and what I'm doing or where mm -hmm. I happen to be lucky enough to go, yeah. I'm thinking about... Uh, other people, so writing, so writing to me is a vehicle for transformation. You mm -hmm. know, like that's what the narrative arc is about. Mm -hmm. You, somebody has an epiphany, but it's not just one epiphany. You know, like there are many epiphanies, and then there's some bigger epiphany. But there are plenty of people in this world who ex who have experienced a great epiphany and then lived their lives in honor of that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been thinking of lately. Mm -hmm. So, for example. I'm working right now on a book about Okmulgee National Park. So we have, so the Okmulgee Mounds National Historical Park is located outside Macon, Georgia. But we're, there is a, there's a grassroots movement to make it into like a national park, like, okay. you know, like whatever, Glacier National Park, a big national park. Mm -hmm. And feasibility studies, like everything is happening. It's important there because that was the homeland of the Muscogee Creek Nation. And and so I'm writing about that. It's not my story, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I know that we're in this era, which is like, why would I be writing that story? But it, it is my story in that I'm from Georgia. I'm an advocate for more preservation of land. I'm friends, I'm, you know, I'm a part of the grassroots group. And yeah, so that's just an example. 
Mm-hmm. I I just I just go I go and hang out with somebody who's an archaeologist in the area. I just hang out and I walk in the woods with them, and then I write their story. So it's sort of an an amplifying of the other person's voice, using what you can bring to the equation, which is your skill at storytelling, your powers mm-hmm. of observation, and and mm-hmm. your your lens of experience. Mm-hmm. to then sort of be the matchmaker between that person's experience and the readers who have the potential to be transformed, to, to use your earlier expression, by it. Yeah, yeah, but it's really more than that. Okay. And Pat did this too. It's, it's that you write in such a way that your experience is the reader's experience. Mm-hmm. And that, so, when, so I get lots of mail. You know how the mail comes in when yeah. somebody reads your book and they love it. And, and yeah, uh, I mean, it's already, this book has only been out a month and it's already coming where, mm-hmm. I mean, really, the mail is already coming. Yes. And what the mail said, what people say is like, that happened to me or I was there. Mm-hmm. Like, I had that same childhood you had. My mother was mentally ill. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is it. It's they read it and they see their own life honored in words. It's that ability to get from the personal to the universal mm-hmm. that, that Pat did so well, that people yeah. would write to him and say, you've told my story um, or your story has saved my life. And sometimes yeah. they meant it figuratively, and sometimes they meant it in the very literal sense that yeah. being recognized, being honored by the words, is the thing that talked them out of self harm or worse. Uh, and what an amazing legacy to have. So I, I can absolutely see why your writing would elicit that same kind of response mm-hmm. that people would see themselves or glimpse some aspect of their lives or their experiences and what you're doing because you have that same ability to go from the personal to the universal. And it's so powerful. It's such an amazing gift to give. So we're deep in the weeds, Jonathan. Yeah, but... well, that's where we end up around here. Yeah. Well, you should have <laughs> warned me, man. But I will. I, I've noticed. So I've been on book tour, yeah. and I've noticed that I'll be, you know, signing. I'll be sitting. I mean, it doesn't matter if you come up. People just come up to talk. Mm-hmm. But what will happen is that people will come up and give me a gift. Not a physical gift, but yeah. they'll give me a gift of a story. Mm-hmm. And so let me, this last night, this young woman came up and she had her cell phone up like this with a pic, so a picture was up on her phone. Okay. She had a book, she had books in this hand, two books, yep. and she had a picture up on her phone and she's like, see that, see that? That's my twin sister. So, so it was her twin sister with me. <laughs> so I had been at a reading yes. at Mercer. Yes. And... There you were. And her twin sister was there. And so she had come. So she was at UGA. I was in Athens. Oh, okay. And, yeah. But it's more than that. Um, let me tell you this one. I was down in Apalachicola uh, a week or two ago, and a man came up and he said that he had a friend who had invented a tool for getting trash out of trees. I was like, well, that's super cool. And he said, yeah, he lives in New York City and he goes out every day with this tool and he takes plastic bags that have fallen mm. into trees. He yep. takes them down. Yeah. And he said, I, I asked him, why are you doing that? And he said, I'm trying to make up for all the terrible things I've done to the environment. Mm-hmm. Well, that man just handed me, he just handed me a little a story. piece of his soul. Yes. Mm-hmm. I love that. I know. And that's what, I mean, if you sat beside... I'm sure it happens to every writer who whose work gets out there and touches mm-hmm. people. But if you sat beside Pat, yeah, you know that people would just come up and give him gym after gym. I sat with him for four hours one night, and that was exactly what happened. And he welcomed that. He wanted that. That's why his signing lines were three, four, or five hours long. <laughs> yeah. He wanted that five-minute person-to-person, mm-hmm. human-to-human interaction with every single person in that line. He was a collector of stories, and he knew it meant something to that reader to be able to, to tell that to him, to share that with him. Plus, yeah. you know, tomorrow morning when he's at his writing desk, <laughs> yes. it might become There's a lot important. of borrowed stories. Yeah, he would say, well, consider okay. that stolen uh, when it was a good one. But, yeah. uh, but that doesn't happen to every writer. I've been at enough book festivals yeah. to know that not every writer can make that kind of connection with the readers that you can, that Pat did, mm-hmm. that Ron Rash can do. That there, I mean, there mm-hmm. are those who do it really, really well. Yeah. 
And there are those who, who don't have that experience and maybe never will. So. And maybe their work is to entertain us and they're writing mysteries, and which we love. We go to the beach and we read mystery or sci-fi. There's some value in that too, yeah. but it's not that, that universal um, experience that we've been talking about. Well, this the, the word classic, mm -hmm. I, I feel very embarrassed to say this, but when I think about what I intended to do here, it took yeah. me a long, I only just realized it today. Mm -hmm. I realized, like, you know, it's like, like, this is my soul in here. Like, I'm trying to create a classic. Mm -hmm. Like, here in the 21st century, yeah. how do we live in relationship to nature and the earth that will sustain life on earth forever? And here's some thoughts I have, you know? It's a big, bold move to try and write not just for the time that you're in but for all times for all audiences well i and probably future. i probably didn't get that far <laughs> you yes. know uh -huh. in fact i study rilke a lot and, and writers like rilke who are yeah. just like how did he get there mm -hmm. how did he actually he so he left the five senses yeah. and got into this other plane Mm -hmm. You know? Yes, sure, but how? Where's the I know. Where's the threshold for that? Yeah. 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 Things like I have been circling, you know, and circling, am mm -hmm. I a bird? You know, like <laughs> how did he get there? I don't know. I would love to get there. Just to just to get to borrow that just to get to read it on the page is pretty powerful. But maybe we should try psychedelics. You know, maybe when we're not recording, <laughs> we can have a conversation about that. But you got us pretty close to out of the weeds, which I appreciate. So let's talk a little bit about what a wild spectacle is. There are, I think, mm -hmm. if my count is right, 16 essays in here written over a period of time. Mm -hmm. But they really fit together almost seamlessly. It's such a powerful experience, the way that you've organized them. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the origin of the book as a book. Though. Yeah. So... Jonathan, uh, in the past, I've tried to have a, the book, you know, ha write books that have a narrative arc that yep. start somewhere, say something, and then sit down. Yes. And in this one, this one is really a collection of essays, you mm -hmm. know. So I, I, what I had to do was choose essays that, and the and the reason I did it was to try to just to try to put them in a solid bundle mm -hmm. um, with a more timeless hopefully make a more timeless product out of it mm -hmm. and a product that sounds just terrible you know i'm just a capitalist sitting here no um <laughs> the other thing is so many writers i look at john mcphee who's a big hero of mine mm -hmm. and john mcphee would write a long a beautiful essay for the new yorker and then after a certain number of those essays they'd get collected yep. into you know compendium of sorts right yes, yes. they mm -hmm. would and i just thought i think i could do that too you know here i am this little female southern nature writer kind of marginal living down in the woods in <laughs> yes. south georgia but it's okay so that's I started thinking about that and mm -hmm. um, and when I looked at at the work that I'd done so these are collected over a number of years and the narrative arc is not chronological mm -hmm. so they skip around you know like my husband is in the first essay uh, so you know I'm married and then way in the middle you know I'm having this fling on a beach in Costa Rica you know it, yes. which I don't know that my husband's even read that one yet but maybe he won't maybe he'll <laughs> never know <laughs> um, so the it's divided into three parts mm -hmm. I forget what the parts are now but but I can tell you what they meridian migration and magnitude yeah so meridian I went to Montana from South Georgia to mm -hmm. study so it so it was it, that part is kind of a coming of age just uh, a lot of powerful, wild things have, have happened to me in the territory of the West. Mm -hmm. So that's all in that first section. The middle section is, I, so I was raised in poverty, and I've, I have not, I never, when I graduated, when I got out of grad school, I didn't take a job at a, a, a teaching position. I wanted to just be a writer. So it meant a certain amount of poverty, you know, during my adult writing mm -hmm. life. But... I, it's been, you know, it's, I have been able to drive that train, you know, I could get up and head up to the writing studio and it wasn't about success for me, wasn't about fame, it wasn't about 
fortune. It was really about something else. Yeah, the, the other something else that we keep circling around yeah. here. So the middle section are more far, far flung places that I was able to see, like the mm -hmm. monarchs overwintering in Mexico mm -hmm. or a month in Alaska that I spent as a writer in residence, places like that. Uh, and then I quit flying about 12 years ago, close to 13 now. Mm -hmm. I quit flying because of the cli of the climate crisis, mm -hmm. and I'm not. I am, you know, I'm not asking other people to do this. I'm not making judgments. I want to fly. I would like to go. I've never seen my ancestral homeland of Scotland, and I want to go back. I want to go there, go back. Yes. Um, I'd love to go to Africa and see the carnivores. You know, I I love travel, but it was difficult for me as an environmentalist and an environmental writer to fly to Portland to speak to 15 people at a bookstore yeah. and fly back. And know what that meant. Yeah, know, and know, know how many pounds of carbon sure. were going into the mm -hmm. atmosphere. So I quit. So a lot of the third section are more regional or local mm -hmm. trips, or journeys, or more inner journeys. So, yeah, just a different way of a different look at travel is in the third section. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that for just a second. Your your decision not to fly, your decision mm -hmm. to live the way you do on the farm. Mm -hmm. Do these feel like forms of advocacy for you? I mean, we sort of think of, you know, when people think of advocacy, it's that sort of immediacy of, of going to the protest march or, you know, increasingly mm -hmm. doing the social media post. Mm -hmm. But for you, you're making choices about the way that you live your life. Have we ever talked about this before? I don't think we have. This is so astute no. of you because most people would not figure that out. Thank you so much. I interviewed a, a seed saver mm -hmm. in Vermont for this, the book on seeds, on heirloom and vintage yeah. seeds called The Seed Underground. Mm -hmm. And in that book, she, say, she said, I see in activism a kind of futility. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, she said, like, we're surrounded by so many broken systems. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if she meant, you know, the, the political system is broken, the mm -hmm. agricultural systems, bro mm -hmm. you know, she just said broken systems. And then she said, I see in activism a kind of futility. The real action is in doing. The real action is in making the broken systems irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. what my husband Raven and I decided to do mm -hmm. that we would you know we'd stop dressing up in penguin costumes holding up signs you know where's yeah. winter mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and marching and getting arrested in front of the white house for you know to try to keep carbon you know carbon dioxide below 350 in the atmosphere but we decided to be proactive and mm -hmm. and plant trees and grow food and so we bought a farm in you know, in South Georgia, mm -hmm. and that's what we do there. Mm -hmm. I try, we try, like, a, su a successful meal for us is one mm -hmm. that has a higher and higher percentage of local food on mm -hmm. our plate. Mm -hmm. Like, we have 100, well, we'll never really have a 100% meal because uh, there we don't have any salt works, you know, nearby. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't produce salt on the coast here anymore. Yeah. So some things are going to have to get imported. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we've been there now a decade, we've sort of relaxed some and we shop more. But there were times, I mean, there were times when we were making honey and soap and beer and wine and mm -hmm. we still make all those things. We, for many years, we milked a cow and from the cow made butter, made yogurt. So we can do it all. But mm -hmm. we don't necessarily do it. Like we buy butter now. Mm -hmm. But to the degree possible, you're you're making choices that you can see are having an impact. You're living a life in a way that's impactful and, and more meaningful to you than perhaps the protest march. Was. So let me so yeah. so maybe an impact like my pollinator garden may be helping a little tiny mm -hmm. you know, pod of pollinators. Yeah. But let me just talk about that a minute. So there is there is individual action and there's collective action. Mm -hmm. Changing policy, like like low up, you know, raising the standards of emissions on on our cars, mm -hmm. or or having power plants lower their emissions. You know, 
those are policy changes that would be collective action. Right. So we're so we experience the climate crisis. We will experience as it, and we are as trauma. It's going to be more storms. The storms are going to do worse damage. There's going to be more flooding in coastal North Carolina and South Carolina. You know that there's going to be more tornadoes. That's just what's coming. There's going to be more drought. So it so there will be the individual trauma where your house floods, mm -hmm. but we also experience it as a collective trauma. And I think that we have to make our individual decisions, but right now the most important thing that we could be doing is the collective the collective healing, mm -hmm. which means passing policy that will stop on a large scale. It will mitigate some of the, some of the damage coming at us. Mm -hmm. How do you hope that your writing, your work, informs that? We talked a little bit earlier about transformation. And there's a, there's a subject that's come up um, on this very show almost every single episode, although we've arrived here in different ways with different writers, is that you know, we, we as a people, Americans, whatever we are, seem to be pretty good at the sort of instant heroism. Like, I mean, we'll do the Heimlich maneuver. We'll grab the cereal box off the grocery store shelf for the old woman who can't reach it. Mm -hmm. We will rush into the burning shed to rescue the puppy. But caregiving, a long-term act in which you actually have to change your own life to help other people, we're not great at that. That's a difficult move for us to make, and that's what's needed on in, on so many fronts, and certainly with with climate justice in particular. To get to that collective action, we would all have to agree we're going to change some aspect of our lives and become caregivers to the planet, and that's that just seems like an increasingly difficult move for people to make, and I don't think it should be, and I can't always understand why that is. Mm -hmm. But but where do you fit into that? What is what is your role as writer, as storyteller, as chronicler mm -hmm. in helping motivate that collective action? Um, can I read a tiny piece Please. that just addresses that? It's a one yes. paragraph or mm -hmm. a couple paragraphs at the very end of the book. Yeah. And one of the most important poses in yoga is a warrior asana. Knees bent and arms outstretched, looking forward over the right fingers. It's a pose that requires strength and balance, training for both the physical body and the wisdom body to respond when we're called to action. In this asana, the demons of ego, fear, and jealousy can be slain. The pose is also a bowing down, a recognition of limitations. Gazing past the fingers, we see both near and far. As my yoga teacher likes to remind me, you need more than a wish. You need burning desire and fierce determination. When I am in this pose, I know that I'm in training, learning to be aware, to not turn a blind eye, to not back down, to not give up. Sometimes the only weapon we have is awareness. Sometimes all we have is a little light that we shine outward into a big darkness. And sometimes we can tap into our superpowers and then we transcend and bring about transcendence. Then we shoot flaming arrows. Most of us, most of our lives are asked to live small. Most of us quit trying very young to live the bigness we know is possible. Now, no matter what I choose or what is asked of me, I know what I became that long, long night I paddled alone through shamanic darkness in the desolate wilderness, just this side of the ultimate wilderness. Mm -hmm. I have seen the warrior. So, I was at a, a commencement, I was giving a commencement address at Warren Wilson College uh, years ago, and a, a cha the chaplain there at the time did the prayer just before I spoke, and I was so moved by this prayer. It, he, you know, he said, he said, Lord, we have, we've educated these students, we've got a new crop of them for you. Mm -hmm. He said, the real work of the world is to be done in far-flung places, often without recognition, without resource, you know, with with no with no kudos. Um, and then he said, "Lord, put them in hard places." Mm -hmm. A lot of our culture, you know, just it's it's 
doesn't ask us to live lives of service. Mm -hmm. I agree, though, we have that potential. And we, Rebecca Solnit has a book about disasters and how people respond after the disasters. And, and she found that, you know, in those, you know, when a disaster happens, you know, the hurricane comes through and, and we're all, you know, none of us have power. We're all trying to figure out how to save the food that's in our refrigerators. You know, the ones with emphysema who are breathing, who need oxygen, you know, are not be, are not breathing well. We can't charge our cell phones. And then this thing takes over, which is we, somebody starts cooking and somebody's got solar power, solar panels down there and everybody can go down there and charge their phones. Mm -hmm. And we go out into the streets and meet neighbors we've never met before. Mm -hmm. So if we can do it in a moment of crisis to respond to that crisis, yeah. surely we can prepare ourselves the word I keep using is resilience. I know you mm. hear it all the time, mm -hmm. but like surely we are a, a species that can, we're so, we're future seeking enough that we can prepare ourselves mm -hmm. to meet the demands. Yeah, that's very well said. And it begins with uh, another word that's in that very passage, awareness. That was right. what I was saying. Yes. And sometimes that's all I'm doing with my work. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, we fell in love with the world as children. And you know we did. You take your baby out to walk and they see yeah. this flower and they're just like, a oh my God, they can't speak, of course, but mm -hmm. they're just staring and staring at this flower, this tree. It's almost like they're channeling, you know, vibrational energy from these other beings. And we all remember that. We remember what childhood was like playing mm -hmm. down by the stream in the woods. Yeah. So sometimes my job really is, you know, when I'm doing a reading is mm -hmm. just to reach people at the place where they were as a child. Mm -hmm. That place of wonder, to use a word yeah. from your subtitle. Yeah. And, and Ron Rash, our friend Ron Rash, feels very strongly about that. And, and we've talked about that very thing, that we've lost that sense of wonder. We had it as children. Um, and so it's still in there. We still have access to it, but mm -hmm. the world kind of gets in the way. But you can remove that. You can remove the barriers. You can still get back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible, and, and it's a powerful thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And Ron, in the same conversation, uh, Ron, I was asking Ron about nature writing, about you know why, why that's central to his writing, why, why he really needs to create this immersive sense of space. And he said, you, you don't care about the thing until you, you are aware of it, or you observe it. To, I forget the exact word he used, but it was very similar to what you've written about being aware of mm -hmm. using awareness as a weapon. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so Ron believed wholeheartedly that he needed to put an immersive sense of nature into his novels for people to then be able to see it in their actual lives as well mm -hmm. uh, and care about it. And in one of your essays, I'm not going to remember the title, you talk about uh, eco-tourism and how we can go to sort of celebrity locations, the Grand Canyon, and mm -hmm. care about that. But we can't take that same sense back to our own neighborhood, our own town, our own community, our own backyard even, mm -hmm. and change the way that we live in a way that, that will honor that place, the place that's our actual home, mm -hmm. in the same way that, that we seem to value having this, this celebrity location honored. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic is kind of changing that, you know, yes. it's, we're, we're getting out on these little trails near our homes yes. and mm -hmm. finding more out more about our neighborhoods. Yes. So, uh -huh. and, and I just, I wanted to dial back one minute and, yeah. and say that Rachel Carson writes so beautifully about wonder, you know, mm -hmm. she, she was, she was, um, I say educating, but you know, she was her, her, she, or she was teaching her nephew, Roger to, learn to love nature and, mm -hmm. and I think through him or maybe because of him she she there's a lot of her work that's about wonder mm -hmm. oh absolutely of wonder yes it, it's we need that we need that in so many ways but certainly we need that to appreciate and then mm -hmm. be responsible stewards mm -hmm. of our of our natural world mm -hmm. so just back to the story yes. yeah I think if you get the person back to that spot mm -hmm. you've 
done your job. And I see it, you know, I see it when I look out and I see that people are close to tears or their eyes are moist, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, their face is twitching because they're trying to hold back <laughs> their tears. Like, then I know well, I've succeeded, you know, like I have reached way back in there and got to this person's deep love for the wild world, um, for the world, yeah, for each other. For, the, for other humans, for our families. And that's what's so crazy that we live in a world that's so divided politically and racially and sexually and all kinds mm -hmm. of ways. And yet we all want the same things. We want good families, good places, good help. You know, we want to be loved. We, we want to belong. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is that sort of universality of it again mm -hmm. uh, but yeah you've got to you got to get there and what a powerful thing for you to get to see an audience actually do in a reading mm -hmm. and that's harder and harder to do in our pandemic times to actually be with an audience in that way versus doing it into a camera as we're mm -hmm. doing it right now which doesn't always have the same impact it's a wonderful tool to reach a much wider audience than you may be able to gather in person but there's something well, about that connectivity person to person that is part of that experience of wonderment as well oh man a spirit moves in a room i mean mm. you know that from going to concerts yeah it's like it's not just about the music yeah it's not about the people on stage like something is moving in the room mm -hmm. and that happens at a great reading it does something's moving man <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, we're running out of time because it no. goes by so quickly. I know I'm disappointed too, and, but we've covered so many things other than, you know, my second and third hour of questions that <laughs> were never going to happen anyway. But I do want to ask uh, one question in closing, and it's sort of important to us here at the Conroy Center, where we spend a lot of time talking about teachers in, in the big sense of that word mentors more, more often than classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. The collection is dedicated to your teachers and many of the characters we encounter along the way are, are teachers in some sense of, of that word to you uh, including those two wonderful women you meet in oxford i absolutely love that chapter so much about the spider women but you seem to have these encounters over and over again where you have the good fortune of being taught in an experience but you yourself are a teacher in many ways as well mm -hmm. so what what does that word mean to you? Why that dedication, <clears throat> mm -hmm. excuse me, for this book? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> During the pandemic, I was having to take my yoga classes online. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I, my yoga teacher is, is just, she's just so spiritual and powerful. But mm -hmm. at the end of every class, you've been down and, you know, when you're bowing down, you thank your teachers, mm -hmm. past, present, and future. Yeah. And so weekly, I would just be reminded, like, as I was bowed down, I would be thinking, well, who's my teacher? And my teacher is not just, you know, my high school English teachers and my major professor in college. It wasn't, my teacher is you. My teacher mm -hmm. is my neighbor child, mm -hmm. you know. My teacher is the man who came up to the signing table and told me the story of, of, of his friend getting plastic bags yeah. out of trees. Yeah. And... Yeah, and I know I know that you're asking about teaching in a different light, but and I'm trying to think of what I want to say about it. So for me, I just, I feel incredibly grateful for it's almost like some crack opened and some piece of wisdom was handed to me, or it might not even be wisdom, it might have just been information that I needed to know. And I really feel so grateful for that. So the book comes out of a place of gratitude. Mm, mm -hmm. I am really so grateful. I mean, Kittredge taught me a way of writing essays that's sort of like a schema, you know. But if I, I would, I've, it, it's what, something I see in every book I read now. But if he hadn't laid it out like that, I wouldn't be the writer I am. Somebody had to, like, really hit me over the head with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful he did. There is an overarching sense of gratitude that comes through in every single page. I absolutely felt that experience as a reader. 
and and wanted others to experience it as well. This this is a book I'll be giving to a lot of young writers I work with mm -hmm. because I think this is subject matter that is going to speak to them in a moment that they very much need to to experience that. Well, so let me just take a minute here in closing yeah. to thank you and the Pat Roy Conroy Literary Center because I see from your social media posts like how dedicated you all are to young, not just young writers, but young students of all kinds mm -hmm. in the area, you know, out of the area. And it, it's, um, it's amazing work. It's powerful work. It's Thank really you. important work. Thank you, Jimmy, so much. Yeah. Pat tried to live his life as a lifelong learner and a lifelong student because he thought mm -hmm. that, that everybody should do that. There was value in always being both of those things mm -hmm. because during the, the roughly 10-year period between when he arrived here in Beaufort mm -hmm. and when he left after The Water is Wide came out, mm -hmm. those were the two roles that, that defined his existence in this absolutely transformative moment for him that made him the man that he was. And he always tried to pass that along. Mm -hmm. So even when he stopped being a classroom teacher, he was still a mentor to so many mm -hmm. of us, including me. And that's ultimately what all of his books are about. They always mm -hmm. circle back around education, his hope mm -hmm. that, that people can be transformed, as you said yeah. earlier in this conversation. And that's mm -hmm. what we try to honor here at the center, the sort of transformative power of story, whether mm -hmm. you're a reader or a writer or both of those things. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a way to experience a narrative in such a way that you begin as one kind of person and end mm -hmm. as another, hopefully a better kind of person. We that, want, that being the we goal, want to transform into better the versions. Others possible too, but yes, yeah. that's certainly the hope here at the center that we really honor that, that transformative power of story. And that's mm -hmm. why it was so special to have you here tonight. Thank you. So welcome it's great back. To be here. And, and thank you for this opportunity and this conversation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And thank you all out there for joining us in our conversation about Wild Spectacle. You can learn more about Janice on her website, JaniceRay.com. And for those of you who might be local tonight, you can uh, join Janice over at Nevermore Books right here in Beaufort, where uh, signed copies of her book will also be available afterwards as well. So thank you all and good night from the Conroy Center. <laughs>